It, 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 it's for me a real pleasure to have uh, Ron Nadias uh, with us today. He took time from his still very busy schedule. Though he is uh, retired, he still has lots of artistic activities. He's a potter, he's an artist, he's still writing. And he tells us about today what he's going to publish uh, very, very soon. And from time to time, local newspapers will ask him to do uh, interviews of, uh, for, their, for their pages and their readers. So uh, still active, and he comes to us from the South Bay, where he lives in? Hermosa. Her, Hermosa, Hermosa Beach. So uh, uh, Ron Arias, I, I thank him. He does this for me often. And so here he is again uh, to come to, to be with us uh, in, in the class. Um, uh, I've had uh, an amazing life in the sense that I have met some really amazing people. You know? uh, and as Ron's saying, with the dinosaurs, you know, uh, uh, Mexican-American uh, culture here in, in Los Angeles. And <clears throat> I have known Ron for quite some time. Uh, I told you last time that we first met in 1975 when I was a graduate student at UC Irvine and a group of us graduate students were putting together a literary contest that was called the Chicano Literary Prize and this was uh, 1975. And this came on the heels of Quinto Sol publications which by 1975 was no longer in existence. No, so. Uh, the graduate students there at UC Irvine thought that perhaps this other way you know, of uh, uh, having new talent uh, win uh, literary awards uh, would be important. Uh, and for a long time, it was the only literary prize, the longest literary prize in existence, the Chicano Literary Prize, and it was from, from UC Irvine. And uh, an unknown writer at that time, uh, uh, Ron Nadia, submitted several stories. Uh, three, all of them quite quite good. Uh, and I've asked him and I've told him that he should put together an, a collection of his, of his uh, short fiction, his creative short fiction. But the story that won the, the prize, the first Chicano Literary Prize, was uh, The Wetback, which is chapter seven. You know, the, uh, seven is that moment you know, of uh, death that comes to visit the community around Elysian Valley. and. Uh, in the LA, in the LA River, um, and I'll talk a little bit, as you know, about what I told you about Latin American literature and 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 Ron Arias, uh, and he won, and I invited through my professor at uh, UCI, uh, Seymour Benton, a well-known Mexicanista, and he invited uh, Tomas Rivera to come give the the talk, the inaugural talk and presentation, and then Ron Arias uh, came. Uh, two, and it was uh, a wonderful evening because these were two storytellers, yeah? uh, and uh, it, besides the dinner and, and knowing them, it was for me quite a treat then to see them both no, tell stories one, one after, one after uh, the other. So that's my a meeting of uh, Ron Arias, and then shortly after that came this book that you have read, The Road, the Road to Tamas Unchale. You, know? you should know that he's from Los Angeles. Most of his life has been here. Uh, but he has traveled. He has lived in, in Europe and traveled in Europe and also in uh, South America. I told you he worked in Buenos Aires and in Caracas. And he could tell us about his experiences there. This was quite early in the late 50s, early, early 60s. And, Latin America was undergoing uh, transformations at, at that time, and this literature that we call the Latin American boom was just was just getting getting under underway. Um, he's had a long career as a journalist for People Magazine, and he was headquartered in, in New York City. Uh, and uh, he can tell stories, and you can ask him about his journalism as what he calls you no know, a parachute reporter that he would just go you know, to the scene and report from there for People magazine. <clears throat> and such events as the uh, Mexico City earthquake of 1985, he reported that uh, for People magazine. Civil wars in Central America, uh, drug wars in, in Colombia, 
uh, Sarajevo, he was there too, and he can tell you about his experiences there. Uh, the tragedy of hunger you know, in Somalia, he was there, he was there too. So these are major events, international events that Ron Nadias knows firsthand because he was there you know, on the ground as, as a reporter for, for People uh, magazine. So that's part of his life and you can ask him, we'll talk about that aspect of, of his life being a journalist, uh, a uh, storyteller, and he's also <clears throat> a writer, you know, a, a novelist, and he has the road to Tamas Unchale. You know. uh, it came along at, at a moment in time when that first boom in Spanish was kind of dissipating in the mid-70s, and a new boom was uh, occurring in, in uh, the United States, and this was the translation boom into English. Uh, and, and then, writers began to read that English translation. But uh, Ron Arias was reading the Spanish originals back back in the 60s. You know, and that's important to note. You know. And then that, the Rotu Tamas Unchale, as I told you, is kind of a cultural translation to take those uh, that invention from Latin America, transform it into uh, Mexican-American or Chicano literature, you know, if you want to call uh, it that. Uh, and then uh, situating his story within Los Angeles, you know, within the Mexican community of Los Angeles. And I said it's not East LA, you no, know, it's that area you know, along Elysian Park and Elysian Valley where he situates the story. Uh, a neighborhood that he knows well that he can tell us about, you know, why he chose that, that area. You know. So uh, uh, we can talk about LA of the 19th of the 1970s, you no, know, of uh, Mexican radio, two stations, Radio Cali and KWKW, you no, know, were the two stations that appear in the road to Tamas and Chale, or theaters like Los Feliz Theater on Fel Los Feliz uh, Boulevard, you no, know, that's another time in Los Angeles, and we can talk about LA then and LA now, and how, <coughs> how he feels about his old world here in LA, and then the new world, which is very promising, from, uh, from the LA Times about uh, the growth of uh, Latina and Latino students in UC. Uh, that uh, is an unprecedented event, and that's, that's important for us. No? So uh, that uh, about uh, Ron, uh, Ron Arias, and um, maybe we can begin with Ron. I'll ask him questions about uh, uh, his travels no, in Germany, as I said, told you he met uh, Ernest Hemingway, you no, know, in 1959, and then uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, took a course in medieval literature, you know, by uh, Jorge Luis Borges, and then met there uh, um, Thompson, Hunter Thompson, and I sent you those two pieces last night by by uh, Ron, you no, know, one about uh, Hunter Thompson and another one about a massacre in Peru that's very much like the massacre that occurs. In a uh, hundred years of hundred years of solitude, you know. uh, so maybe we can begin uh, with that, Ron. So let's welcome Ron. <laughs> He's a teacher, so sometimes he stands. You know, too. Yeah. yeah, you forgot to mention that I, I taught for thirteen years. He taught for thirteen years, so he's he's also a teacher, you know, as well as a potter and an artist. Right, <laughs> and a storyteller and a journalist, so he does quite a few, quite a few things. Uh, you were in Germany uh, for some time, no, in high school right. there, yeah. And you could tell the class why you were in Germany and why in high school there. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me, and yeah. I'm glad to see that uh, there's some people still interested in uh, what people like me write. And, uh, I always say uh, writers are s people with readers and uh, in my is my voice okay you're good it's, I have a very soft voice and it's great for rocking kids to sleep <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just got back from Japan and visiting my son who has a new son so I have an eight month old uh, grandchild grandson and uh, I just love holding him, and, and my voice apparently just puts him to sleep. So <laughs> I hope I don't put you guys to sleep. Uh, I'm, 
I'm amazed that there aren't more guys in here. It's mostly women. I only see three three guys, I think. That's right. That's what has happened. I'm, I'm just too. curious why. Is that, uh, because they're smart. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what, uh, when you read about the growth of the Latino, mm -hmm. it's really Latina, which is more amazing. Really amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. great. And you see, yeah. So, uh, anyway, Germany. Yeah, Germany. Uh, when I, uh, as Hector said, I grew up in, I was born in Chinatown actually and baptized in the Placita a long time ago in 1941. And, uh, and then I grew up around Griffith Park uh, where Dodger Stadium is. That was s sort of my playground and the LA River. I used to, before they fixed it up, uh, that's my guy. friends and I would go down there, and that was our jungle. It was our our escape land, and uh, and I guess that's where I got uh, started using my imagination. You know, when you play, that's what you're doing. And kids do it all the time, and and then most of us as adults we lose that ability. Well, fortunately, as a writer, I can still indulge myself in that, <coughs> but. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, my mother um, married uh, uh, a second time, and I never knew my first father until I was an adult. Uh, I, I tracked him down. Uh, that was after my mother died. But I was raised by a military man who was an army officer, joined up. Uh, he was from Nogales, Arizona, and uh, so I, from about 13 on, after the Korean War, and he spent some years in a prison camp in North Korea, uh, Armando Arias was my adoptive father, and I thought he was my father, I'm mean, my biological father. Uh, when he got back, uh, we were sent overseas. And so I went to high school in Stuttgart, Germany. I learned hitchhiking German, you know, enough to get by. And, uh, and that got me wanting to travel. I loved Europe, and I loved just getting out of the house and hitchhiking around France or Italy or Spain. And in Spain, that's where I met Hemingway in Pamplona. So I was 16, 17, seeing the world, and that got me into the travel bug, which uh, when we moved back to California, I moved back, and I went, uh, started college. Um, I wasn't a very good student. Went to Oceanside Carlsbad Community College. Now it's called Maricosta, I think. And, uh, Went to school for about a year and a half there, and it was sort of a surfer school and a party school. And I really got the reading bug, and most of my time was spent in the library. That's where I was really learning things. And uh, finally, I got tired of just the party scene. I was, even though I was an editor of the, the school newspaper, I knew I wanted to write. Hemingway encouraged me to write, uh, and I write about that uh, in this collection that's coming out pretty soon. It's called My Life as a Pencil, and it's sort of the stories behind the stories I wrote as a journalist, the, the real, more interesting stories, not the people I wrote about, but my particular story, the backstory, you might call it. Um, and uh, so, at the college, after a year and a half of that party time, I said, I got to get out of here. So I went to, I transferred to Berkeley. Well, that was like hitting a wall because the Berkeley students then, I'm sure now, are the top. They were the best. I didn't even think about UCLA because I just heard Berkeley was the best. So I wanted to learn. I don't know why, oh, my parents had moved to Travis Air Force Base. My dad was stationed there. And that's why I went to <coughs> thinking I'll be closer to them, to home. And, uh, but 
it was um, uh, a steep learning curve for me uh, because I got into literature courses, uh, uh, took some courses by Nobel Prize winners, uh, real heavyweights. And from you come from a junior college, party school. All, all they wanted to do is surf, and I got into tennis, and that was fun, but it was unrealistic. And in those days, I didn't even know the word minority, but I really was a minority, not only an ethnic minority, I think the other so-called minorities were mostly Arabs or Middle Easterners. <coughs> uh, so there I was in the Spanish department, and that was a, kind of a salvation for me, even though I was an English major. So I took some courses in, um, in the English department and uh, literature courses in the Spanish department because I grew up with Spanish. Uh, I thought I could handle it, but it was tough, tough going because I didn't have that discipline as a student, but I learned fast. And I had a job as a sort of a janitor uh, in a sorority. Uh, now you might think that's, that's pretty cool for a guy, <laughs> a straight guy who's got these women, well, it was a tough job because I had to clean all their stuff and I even wrote a short story about it. It was called Stoop Labor because I was always stooped over emptying their trash cans. And then in those days you had to incinerate everything. And it was pretty awful stuff that I had to incinerate. And, and uh, so that <laughs> led to, uh, that was just part of my life in Berkeley. Um, but I met some teachers that uh, encouraged me uh, to see the world. And I was taking a Latin American geography course. And uh, from a well, uh, very, they were all published. These were major figures in literary criticism or in this anthropology. Uh, I lasted a year in, in Berkeley. And uh, I was only 20 years old, but I wanted to bust out and see the world, and I picked Argentina. If you've read that little story on Hunter Thompson, you, you get the, the explanation of why I went. And, uh, um, they spoke Spanish, so, and I knew how to write a, a news story, I thought. And uh, I just went, got a little scholarship to send me down there from the Inter-American Press Association. And I just wanted to understand my roots, where I came from, this whole Spanish thing. Who are we, Mexicanos? And in those days, I was raised in a family where it seemed to be a, a, a matter of shame to admit you were Mexican. <coughs> so, and we were very Mexicano, but my mother always said, oh, we're French, Portuguese, and Spanish. We're never Mexicano. And yet we were always going to Tijuana or <coughs> Juarez. Or we'd make trips all over Mexico, down to Mexico City. And, and, and there was a sort of a elephant in the room, the elephant of shame. So I grew up seeing people who felt inferior because of who they were. I wanted to take something off of that, that and see who the hell we really were, where we came from. And what I discovered was a world of, of diversity. We're everything, especially in Mexico, but all over Latin America. So I went to Buenos Aires, which is like going to Paris or Barcelona or Milan, uh, very European. They didn't look anything like the Mexicanos I knew. Um, and they spoke a very different accented Spanish. And so I had to learn that. Che veni, sentate. Right, yeah. If you went to Cuba, you'd have to learn that. And uh, when I came back, I, uh, after a year there in Buenos Aires, I saw that part of the world and I said, I, I'm hungry. I gotta go see other parts. 
And so I ended up two years in Peru in the Peace Corps. And I went, I was trained in Puerto Rico. And uh, I started seeing we're a bit of everything. And I'm still fascinated by the different accents. Whether you're from Honduras or Panama, Peru, Argentina, Colombia, different parts of Mexico. We all, you know, the Chilangos are, I always thought they were from Mexico City, but they're from the outside. Right, they, they come, come in. There. Well, I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> so traveling all over Mexico, that was a fascination for me, but also the world. And now it's <laughs> like I'm on a, a commuter plane to, to Japan because I have three grandsons there. My son sort of become Japanese. He's, <coughs> he's a movie director there. And if you really like anime, uh, you, he's one of the cutting edge directors in that. And he won the Japan's uh, um, Oscar for best animation about four or five years ago for one of his movies. Um, animation, but he also does live action. And he's married uh, the second wife, the first and the second. Uh, they're both Japanese, and so I've got Hapa kids, they call them that, because they're sort of half and half. So my grandsons are part Mexican, part Russian Jewish, and half, uh, if you want to divide people like that, uh, Japanese. But uh, they speak uh, fluent English, American English, and I hope someday they They'll blend in right here because uh, that news article that the best thing I read today in the LA Times was that <laughs> Latinos now make up 33% of the UCLA campus population. That it was, Hector and I were saying in the 60s, we could, the, all the entire Latino population at UCLA could fill this room and that's it. What, 60 guys? 60 guys, guys, yes, and that's the difference from 60 guys. It's, it's incredible, oh, and it really is gratifying. That was the best news. Um, and of course, Asians are 44%, as you know, when you walk out. So my grandkids are going to fit right in. <laughs> um, so I, I don't want to just make it about my life, I know that's what, why I'm here, but I'd like to answer some of your questions about some of my work. Uh, and by the way, I picked journalism, well, after write-off, because it was an accident, I like to write, and, and I improved writing. Uh, it wasn't always easy, it's never easy, uh, because writing, I believe, for me, it's mostly thinking. It's, I just sit in my little cueva, Behind the garage, I have what I think of as my writing cave, but sometimes it's, it's also a laboratory where I just try out new ways of saying something. Uh, the stories I write, whether they're true or fictional, and uh, it doesn't matter for the reader, you just want a good story. Uh, and that's how I've always thought of myself uh, as a storyteller, although I've written in every form, poetry, uh, technical reports. Uh, I brought uh, some of the books, and very few don't mention this one, but it's a medical book, because I ended up writing about, writing Dr. Oz's book, first book, uh, Mehmet Oz. Uh, and I was going to put up my total production as a writer. It's not much, you know, I'm really very minor, but I worked hard to do this. Uh, and I think uh, I would like to use the excuse that I was a journalist, so I've got thousands of stories written, and that took a lot of effort. But if I were, this, these are, this is the one of the editions of Tamas Unchale that I like from Pajarito Press in New Mexico. But I wrote this one here, and that was um, Five Against the Sea. And that's, sort of a, it's a journalistic work, but I tried to write it like a novel. And to do that, I had to live with five Costa Rican fishermen who were 
adrift in the Pacific for five months. And I like survival tales, and this was ultimate one for me. And they all live without killing each other or eating each other or dying. And, uh, and I wrote this back in the 80s. I took a leave of absence from uh, People magazine. And the last book I did, mainly because I was getting bored with my writing job at People magazine, and it, this would allow me a, a leave. And I wrote this called White's Rules, Saving Our Youth One Kid at a Time. It's about a guy who ran a one-room school, one schoolhouse for gang members, gangbangers. He was refor reforming. Anyway, uh, so I wrote that book, and now I'm about to publish a little, what they call a chap book, My Life as a Pencil. Um, and you've got, read a couple of those stories. And uh, I'm working on a novel. It's probably the biggest challenge I've had ever as a writer. But <clears throat> I sound like I'm dying, but I'm trying to keep the promise to my grandsons that I would live to be a hundred. And uh, the, this project will take about that long. It seems like. <laughs> yeah. um, so questions? I'd, I'd rather well, answer questions. Could I ask? Now tell us about moving <coughs> moving target, which is uh, okay. about you and about yeah. your family. And it's, a, it's an amazing memoir. story that has the actual facsimile letters <coughs> written by his mother there in there in her handwriting, and the relationship between uh, her husband and she, and then you trying to find out about your family. Could yeah. You, well, yeah, as I, I said, <coughs> I was raised by one man I thought was my father, and then. Um, and I always thought I had a pretty dull family because uh, one of the writers I like most like when I was uh, just out of high school was uh, Eugene O'Neill, the playwright. In fact, there's a play of his uh, they're putting on now. And he, anyway, he wrote back in the 20s and 30s. And I always thought, gee, he he's a, has an interesting family with uh, alcoholic mother and, or drug-addicted mother, alcoholic father and all these problems and I thought gee why don't I have a family that's interesting to write about? <laughs> then it turned out I did I just didn't know it and, and I was naive because no one ever lifted up the carpet or opened the closet doors a few times my grandmother would and she was uh, sort of ranchera from uh, Chihuahua in the southern part of uh, Chihuahua, near Durango, Parral, that area, in the mountains with Tarumara Indians. That, and she always said, I must have a little Tarumara because they all the men messed around in her family. And, um, <clears throat> but she'd tell me a little bit about her family. And that got me interested in my, my roots. But, uh, so when I, growing up, uh, some of the problems in my family started to surface and that, uh, um, something started to affect me because I, I realized, Jesus, uh, I have a strange family here. Here's a family where we had to say the Rosario every night for my father, my adoptive father, who was a prisoner in China or North Korea during the Korean War, and there was a radio priest, and and we'd have to say the rosary every night. And then when he did was released, came home, he was a changed man. He had what they now call PTSD, and uh, <clears throat> he came back sort of a, a silent sphinx. He just wouldn't talk about anything, and uh, or, and it turned out uh, later when I did the research for this book, it took me about 15 years to piece it all together. I, they, he underwent a lot of torture. Uh, you know, they talk about waterboarding. Well, they had their own uh, tortures. I won't go into that. You got to read the book. 
<laughs> but uh, so this very strange man comes home, the marriage goes downhill, and I'm witnessing all this, and I try to escape. I go to Buenos Aires, Peru. And meanwhile, my mother and my father just, uh, it's going downhill, and then suddenly, oh, and I'm married. I'm still married to the same woman, uh, Joan, and we have a little baby. He's the movie director. Uh, <clears throat> and so my mother got to see the baby and my wife, and my, my wife, turns out, is the other, op the opposite of my mother. My mother was very uh, religious, Mexicana, um, there was sort of a, a public mother, all smiles, and then a private one. And that was sitting by the radio, listening to her rancheras. We used to call it her crying songs, the, the lloronas. And, and just, so I heard that music. I grew up on all that, uh, the, not just Pedro Infante, but uh, Lucha Villa, and on and on. Um, and then uh, uh, we were, let's see, we had es another escape because uh, my, my wife, who's very argumentative and lets you know exactly how she feels, something my mother would never do unless it was in, in, in a fit of rage or rabia, um, they didn't get along, and so we were always living elsewhere. And now we were in Washington, D.C. I was working as a, a PR guy for an international bank. It was the Inter Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Inter it's like the World Bank. And it was the most boring job in the world because I was just sort of scripting little um, press releases about big loans. And, and never got outside of my little uh, cubicle. Um, but we had a little, we had two babies now. And then I get word that my mother just died. And it looked like a suicide. Or maybe my father killed her. You know, we go through the funeral and uh, it was very emotional. And then it turns out, I. I my, I, we, I come back to Washington, and then my father uh, tries to commit suicide on her grave. So I fly back for another uh, meeting with my two brothers. So what happened? Well, I won't go into the whole story, but uh, because, again, you got to read the book. That just threw my world of, uh, gee, I got this boring, nice family. Well, it wasn't. And there were all kinds of things going on. I didn't know them. I didn't know my real father. My grandmother led me to him eventually. Uh, and, and that was uh, an eye opener. Uh, cool guy. But anyway, uh, he didn't raise me. So I had no emotional attachment to him. Uh, his name was Bonifacio, or he called himself Frank. And his name, which would have been my name, was Giner. G-I-N-E-R, or Geiner, as he called himself. But he was from Juarez. <clears throat> um, anyway, uh, so I had, and then my father was living with my younger brother, who was 10 years younger, in Las, the Las Feliz area, near uh, the observatory up there. They were living in an apartment. I get a call from him, and he says, you know, our uh, daddy, he always called him, we called him daddy. He's disappeared. And we never saw him again. He just disappeared. Well, years later, this is after teaching and out in San Bernardino, Valley College. If anybody's from out there in the Inland Empire, that's, I spent all of this years there teaching I was sort of one of the token Chicanos hired in the 70s, uh, teaching Shakespeare, which I knew very little about, but they say, hey, you know, we need a, bo a brown body. And I wasn't that brown, but I would do. And I could, I could, uh, I had a degree, and, uh, 
and could teach there at, at the community college. Uh, but so <clears throat> back, and we, my wife and I both uh, quit our job. She was a Spanish teacher at Cal State San Bernardino, and uh, and then at Laverne University of Laverne. Jewish girl from New York, or Newark actually, and who spoke better Spanish than I, and has a doctorate from here. And that's where we met, in fact. We met uh, on the other wing. Uh, what's it called on the first floor with the very slow elevator? Still slow. Well, <laughs> I remember the day I met my wife, and she just started arguing with, with me about some poem. Uh, Gongura poem, I think, and she was telling me the real meaning, and I thought I knew it all, and she destroyed me, and I fell in love with her, because <laughs> I was getting a real person, not some fake, or some something scripted, as I like to think of, or make-believe, because uh, my mother was, that was, she was my other main influence, but she was so different, and uh, anyway, we moved to New York, uh, left our teaching jobs, and uh, that's when I decided I got to find out about my family. You know, I'm a reporter. I go all over the world. I, I interview. You name the person, I've interviewed that person. Not just celebrities and movie stars and sports stars, but heads of state and uh, uh, scientists, and authors. Uh, and I get into some, covered a lot of wars and uh, famines and all over Africa, Middle East. Why can't I write about my own family? So over 15 years, I, any chance I got, I would take advantage and I would interview somebody who knew my father or fought with him in World War II because he was also a prisoner of the Nazis. I created a person that I never knew, but a lot of people did. And, uh, and then I discovered a lot about my own family, my own past. I can't see you. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> uh, so you look a little like my mother, that's why. <laughs> and she was beautiful. Uh, there's a couple pictures of her. And uh, so I, the book I wrote, it's almost like a documentary. That's how I approached it. Um, you can you can have a look. I don't know. <laughs> it's her when she was about 16, 17, on the streets of Juarez, I think, because she was from El Paso, and uh, but we would go back and forth to Chihuahua. Okay, uh, what was the question? Was there a question? <laughs> and then uh, what you found out about him as a spy and oh, yeah. all he that he went through. Oh yeah, he was an army spy. He, uh, his mission in Europe was to <coughs> voluntarily get himself captured and then escape. He was an escape artist. And uh, I had to track down the man that he was with. He was a platoon leader, a second lieutenant. And uh, they would tell me he would pretty much walk into the arms of the Nazi soldiers with his hands up, get himself captured. And then what, he, what I pieced together was that he would report on the troop movements, the prisoner movements, back to Germany and where they went. And then he would escape. And he lived with a free French. And he either, even fathered another. I must have a sort of a half sibling she would be. At that time, I believe he was my biological dad, so I thought, oh, this, I have a sister in France, a half sister. And, and that woman does exist, and there's an article about her and that I, I found. I never met her. I also met um, my other half sister from my father's, my biological father's second wife after divorcing from my mother when I was one. Um, so those secrets started coming out, and I just tried to flesh them, make the people look like real people, feel like real people. And um, so that took a long time. 
And it took me a longer time to find the voice, because I'm not used to writing confessional kind of things uh, about myself and how I feel about this or that. Uh, so after much experimentation, and for me, a lot of writing, if you're going off the formula, because most of journalism is formula. That's why I could do it as a living. You know, you have who, what, where, when, why. And there are many ways to write uh, sort of standard American journalism. It, it, because it's all about speed now. And if you try to get creative, you're, you're doomed. Because you'll go off the rail. You, you, have, to, it's, you have to compete. And that's what, why I was glad I retired, because the students today who go through journalism, or <coughs> young people, they're all very savvy with, with devices. And I sat through the Michael Jackson trial, sitting next to Greta Sestrin, I remember. She's on CNN, I think, or Fox. And I, that was the first time I'd seen somebody write a story on a Blackberry. And I was fascinated. Man, she had the fastest thumbs. <laughs> and a lot of the talking heads I see now, I had been with them when Blackberries and all these digital uh, inhaled devices were just coming in. But now, I'd be a fossil. I don't think I could keep up. Uh, because I'm still with a laptop. And, uh, and I have my old typewriter. Uh, you don't know what a typewriter is, but it's that old clunky <laughs> thing. And uh, when I left journalism, I, to be able to get back into the world of fiction, it was almost impossible. It was hard. So I got out my old typewriter. I had it redone. I looked all over LA to buy a ribbon because you had to use this right. black silk ribbon that it would go through. And they're in museums now, if you want to see it. <laughs> and, and that got me started. I started hitting the keys the way I did back in the 60s in Buenos Aires. And, and I started flowing. Because you, you think about words more if you uh, know that if you hit the wrong key or you put the wrong word, you've got to white it out. White out was this white stuff you put in. Then type over it again. So it wasn't like today where you could hit delete and you just cut and paste and all the things we do now, editing our own stuff in a computer. But we didn't have computers in those days. So, so I got my, com my old typewriter out and I started writing this, this novel idea. And also these stories, which are really exercises for me. Because it got me, it freed me up from uh, regular journalism. Because I was writing stories about myself, about taking a five mile run with Daniel Ortega, the now president, then president of uh, Nicaragua. And that was my first story, actually. And I got that published, uh, won a prize for that. And I thought, well, gee, I should do a whole book of all these stories behind stories. And that loosened me up so that now I'm comfortable with this character from the 16th century that I'm writing about. Um, and it's, it's, just, it's about all of Latin America, in a sense, and, and all of humanity, because it has chinos and japoneses and uh, Englishmen from London and other parts, Africans. A lot of people don't realize that, and it's taken me years of research and reading lots of books by some scholars who were even from UCLA, one of Barbara Fuchs, realize that uh, the, what we see today, you cross over into, cross the border, and the people you see and their history, they probably don't even know they have such a history, but the, the uh, one thing I did discover is that if they did a DNA test on most Mexicanos today, all of us would have some black blood, African. Because it was uh, when most of the Indians, the indigenous people in Mexico died in the 70 years after the Spaniards arrived, mostly from disease. <coughs> 
Ebola-like disease. Not smallpox the way they've found, but there's uh, some scientists at UNAM uh, in Mexico City who've proven that it was a rat-borne, probably bat, maybe rats, um, and there were several uh, outbreaks that devastated. So most of, let's say, what is today Mexico, 17, 18 uh, million, reduced to one million, all over Mexico. So what did they have to do for labor, to run the mines, plantations? They bring slaves from Africa. And, uh, and they supplied a lot of the heavy lifting, especially in the obrajes, or the, uh, like silk, and uh, um, the tool making. The Africans were the ones who they relied on the most, and they were physically much stronger than the than the Indians, the, the Nawa, and the, the many tribes. But what I'm saying is that there was a lot of what mestizaje, miscegenation, and in that those 70 years after the conquest, it that hasn't been treated in fiction. Or there's never been a story about all of because that's the foundation for what there is today. And that's also the story of, of most of Latin America, the importation of African slaves. And it's given us our, our everybody's contributed, of course, I mean, not just China Poblanas from the Chinese influence, but there, I came across Japanese slaves. Uh, a lot of people, it was a brutish world, in this hierarchy. And the people up on top were a very few white, criollos, Spanish, up at the top. And the rest of us were down here, all mixed up. And uh, anyway, I've, I think I've read enough to it sort of imbibed a lot <coughs> so that they're just facts. And I just want to write a good story about that time, but connected to the present. So why am I off on that? Tell, tell, tell them about the storyline. England, oh, Mexico. Oh yeah, the basic storyline. And, and listen, you know, I'm, I'm tired of uh, the whole, I, I've never said this publicly, but okay, I think it's on. the Chicano literature, uh, we talk about Latino literature, Chicano literature. Uh, Back in the 60s, we were unique. A few of us could write stories, and there was Pocho, there was there were a lot of stories. Tomas Rivera, Rolando Hinojosa, and I, and then the, the brown buffalo, Acosta. Uh, we were writing, that was a big deal, so we, they, somebody labeled us Chicano writers, and, uh, and then they started having departments and classes, and then I'm just flattered that people are still reading this, and also El Camino a Tamasucha, the translation. Uh, but I think we're just writing for ourselves all these years. We just talk among ourselves. And, and yet, I had people who have nothing to do, like some of my, my wife's, uh, relatives back in Boston or New York, wherever they're from, they're, you know, they're uh, raised on the usual, uh, uh, what they call the literary canon. You know, you read Walt Whitman, you read uh, Moby Dick, Hemingway, Faulkner, and then foreign writers to Dostoevsky. Where are the Chicanos from? They'll read this and they'll say, hey, that's pretty good. I, 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 they liked it. And, and I gave it a sort of a, a, the approach that sort of a fable it allowed me to do things that um, other conventional approaches wouldn't allow me to, you know. Uh, moving back in time and space, for example. And things I picked up just by reading other people, especially Latin American authors like Garcia Marquez or Borges, Cortázar. Um, anyway, I think I wish that 
I would hope, I should say, that this, this book that I'm writing now, I hope it, it comes off the way I think it will, or the way I foresee, and that it'll get a wider readership. Because most things that are written by Latinos, and that's even the, the, uh, the, uh, some of the Cuban-American guys who win Pulitzer Prizes, or uh, when you win a prize, it, it just means you have the stamp of approval, and then it goes to the giant New York publishing machine. And I worked in New York, so I know how that system works. <coughs> People Magazine, you can't get more mainstream than that. Very superficially mainstream. Uh, in fact, most of journalism, you never really get too deep in anything before you're off and running after something else. So now that I'm retired, I have a chance to reflect on things and sometimes go to sleep. <laughs> That's the, I don't have the energy I used to, but I'm still very interested in knowing the whys. Why did, how we got to be the way that we were. So one of the things I, that's always interested me is the past. And I read a lot about the journals, the, uh, whether they're written by French traveling in Latin America or, or, or Brits or Africans. Unfortunately, not many black Africans wrote about their experience. You know, that had to be done in fictional ways or by historians. And lately, a lot of feminists are getting into the, the role of women in not just European cultures, that came to the New World, but also uh, uh, indigenous cultures. Uh, I'm reading a book on the on the women in uh, Nahua women in, uh, before the conquest, and it's just on because I want to know how they raised their children. Uh, if you were living before the Spaniards and Europeans arrived, how did you raise your child? Uh, what were the languages taught to you? Their belief system, their superstitions, their religion. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I wanted to write about something that's partially true that I read about. An orphan from London, England. This is in the 1560s. So it's already well into the, the uh, new world, a, a new order of things that the Spaniards imposed in, uh, in Mexico and elsewhere. Um, and this orphan ships out on a, on a ship. And in those days, uh, kids who were just street kids, they'd some, bring them onto the ship to, to do the dirty work. And if they got sick and died, they just tossed them overboard. You were pretty expendable. It was, it was uh, not a pretty life at sea. So I, my central character is this kid because I wanted a third party. And that's another thing a lot of Chicanos don't recognize or talk about is that we use English, at least in my generation was probably the first, starting uh, because that was what we were educated and brought up in. Sure, I could write this in Spanish, but I, it would be my second language, my awkward language. Maybe Japanese, my third. I'm getting to So I can carry on with conversations in, in Japanese. No, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and we, sure, it's a language of Shakespeare. I, I, was, I went to the English department here and at Berkeley, but I also went to the Spanish department. I went through their courses. And, and I think we're in a unique position because we have both worlds. That Anglo-English world, it may seem alien to you, but if you're speaking in English, you, you might as well find out more about it. And the Spanish-speaking world. And then the indigenous languages, too. And I know some I can get by in Quechua, for example, which is what the Incas spoke. And that's because I studied to go to the Peace Corps and work with Indians there. 
And that's like a trip to the past uh, where I was. Uh, it's like walking back into the 16th century in some of the towns. Um, so my character ends up on a ship that's the first African slave run that the British started. And that started a couple hundred years of very lucrative trade. Somebody had to supply all the black slaves the labor, mainly free labor, taking human <coughs> beings and bringing them to the uh, West Indies and to the rest of America, uh, or the Americas. Or the, in those days, it was called Las Indias. So, uh, and, and then uh, the government gave it the name Nueva España, but then you'd have different parts of Latin America called different things, either by the Portuguese or Spaniards, but they were bringing over slaves at that, those, that 16th century period, uh, uh, allowing, um, well, the British finally got involved, and the French, and the Dutch, and uh, uh, sort of pushed aside or uh, a lot of the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, slave, slave traders. And the English were very good at it, but this was the first run made. And this kid ends up shipwrecked on the shores of what's today Mexico. And he spends 20 years, partially, some of them as a slave, and he changes his attitude. And uh, he learns Nahua, and he learns Spanish. He's only 12. Uh, but his saving grace, and this is <clears throat> partially true, uh, is that his father taught him to write. And that was unique. He was, his father was a scribe. And so he saves his skin many times because of his ability to write. Not just write in, in English. And this is, I had to study some, all of these languages to get down how they spoke, how they wrote, but also in, uh, in Spanish he wrote. Um, four centuries later, there's a, a, a book dealer who's in London. This guy is a book dealer from Los Angeles. His name is uh, Martin Medina. And his wife, um, <coughs> as a gift, since, says uh, there's a conference on antiquarian books. Uh, would you like to go? Because he's kind of in a funk and uh, because he just sold his bookstore. And he has not, not much to do except read. And so they go, and he's a book guy. And when he's there at the conference, he's getting bored. And he ends up on the streets of Greenwich looking for an estate sale. And he discovers a journal that's all falling apart. And it was a journal written by this boy who had lived 20 years in Mexico at the time. So you get a snapshot of what life was like there. And the, the, this, I mentioned the Ebola outbreak there. Well, it's very much like Ebola, and it's still there. But it's like Ebola now, is a, they, they're containing it. Uh, <clears throat> he witnesses that uh, and a lot of other things that, that make what is today modern Mexico. Um, so this man from LA discovers this journal. He buys it for sort of like a robo because the fellow doesn't realize the, 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 the value of this journal. And uh, and then he rushes back to the hotel to meet his wife for dinner, but he's got to take a piss. And he runs into a Hyde Park that's in London, uh, restroom, and then he's mugged. When he wakes up in a, after a coma in the hospital, he doesn't have that journal. And nobody will believe him. But he sat and read it before he bought it in the attic of this estate. Hours, so the story has just lightened him up. He saw another world that he didn't that, that he'd been hungering for to to understand, and he calls it clarity. But it's in his head, 
and nobody will believe him. He goes back to L.A., and it's he, he's living that world. So he says, well, I'm just going to write it. So that's my book. Uh, that's the main, the, that kid and his view of, and he, it's written in English because the kid was English, but uh, it's about people in all walks of life at that time and in different industries, different parts of Mexico. Um, and he's a slave himself. And he works himself out of that, but uh, so that's a storyline. And he has a love, you know, a romance. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. And there's a connection to the present day guy, this Medina. Um, so, another question? <laughs> I've never yes. summarized it. Yes, yes. When are you going to be done with it? Oh. Well, I'm finally in the right. I got this thing out of the way. No more journalism ever. Because <laughs> it's not the same. It's mechanical writing. Journalism, I think, generally. And, uh, and memoir writing. And I just want to get into this kid's world. It's a 12-year-old. So I look at my 12-year-old grandson, I wonder, what's going on in your mind? I barely remember what it was like to be 12. A young man, but in a world where they didn't have electricity, they didn't have anything in this room, pretty much. Maybe wood, if this is wood, glass. But try to imagine that world. So I had to do a lot of reading. The technology was very different. And I know it's taking me far afield, but it's my interest in, in, I don't know, it's not a Chicano interest, it's just me. And I, as I said, I've written about a lot of things that are not, you know, Mehmet Oz is not Chicano, he's Turkish. But I wrote a whole chapter about his growing up in Turkey. And I can do that with most stories, but I'm tired of writing other people's stories, I want to write this kid's story. No. I don't know. I'm trying to give you a little peek into a writer's, my, my mind, and what I go through writing. It's not easy, uh, you know, facing the blank page. Uh, but, <clears throat> I mean, if I can give you some practical tips, I will, if you want to ask them. Any other questions? Questions class about <clears throat> stories Remember, that he's covered? I was where you guys are now, out there. Yeah. Uh, in your book, uh, The Road to, to Mazunjale, mm -hmm. uh, were any of the characters like Carmela, uh, Marceliano, or Fausto, are they in some way based in people that you've met in real life or, or <coughs> that yeah, I've known Fausto, personally? Fausto, for example, is a lot of my grandmother. Yeah, same kind of sense of humor. And, some of those, the whole playing with death. We, when she was in her 80s, she would we'd go visit her in her little white cottage house near the L.A. River. And, you know, this is a neighborhood, a lot of all kinds of people, but mostly she called them La Chicanada, all around, gangbangers. And, and there she was. The world around her changed, the neighborhood changed, but she was there, the old lady from Chihuahua. And we'd visit, open the gate, go inside, my wife and my kids, and we'd, Mama, from this desk. And she'd be in her bed with the sheet over and just lying like that. And we'd think, oh, it was something, you know, she finally died. That's our first thought. And then just as we're about to pull the sheet off, she goes, ah, she laughed. <laughs> you know, it's stuff like that. And uh, that was Fausto. And then Marcelino was pretty much um, a composite of different, uh, actually, in Peru, I knew some, some uh, sheep herders, or alpaca herders, and llamas. Everybody had yamas if you were uh, in, uh, indigenous or Quechua speaking. So he was there, and uh, Mario, 
the pachuco or the the street kid he was a guy in my class uh, his name was luis davila i think it was but he or luis garza that was his name and he was a kid in i wrote this book in san bernardino I, uh, usually started writing around 11 o'clock at night after the kids were asleep I'd go back up to my college office and I'd write until about one for two three <coughs> weeks straight I did that and I to get started uh, because it was bursting out of me this whole little fable that I dreamt up but it was based on real people and Garza was one of these guys uh, who spoke Caló, you know, he, or the Chicano, sort of, uh, I think it came from El Paso originally, Caló, is this twisted up uh, Spanish, and now I listened to, on the way here from Hermosa Beach, I was listening to uh, 96.3, <laughs> which is, I swear, that this had never happened before, but, and then I started listening to the other Spanish stations. A lot of them are a mix of English and Spanish, but correct. They use phrases in English and then jump into the Spanish. And, um, and the music I liked. And anyway, uh, <clears throat> this, that was Luis. And he spoke with, a, you know, everything was ese. Orale, pues. He spoke like... Um, Pachuco, you know, and uh, who were the other characters? Well, Cuca was really my, my, I had an aunt, a great aunt named Cuca, and, uh, and there were other characters that all came from my childhood, family, uh, whatever suited, and uh, I was close to them, and some people say I really liked the characters. Yeah, I did. I don't think there are any evil. Even the cop is not an, an evil guy. He's kind of made to be a dupe or silly. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you take from real life, and uh, uh, I can't make up a Cinderella, but I bet the guy who invented Cinderella, there was somebody like that in his or her life. Who wrote it? <laughs> anyway, it's any a fable. other questions? The yes, sir. The grandbrothers? The grandbrothers brought Cinderella? The, the grandbrothers? The brothers. They wrote Cinderella. Okay, so they, found. they found. They found the Thanks. <laughs> it's a fable. Uh, any other questions about writing or about what I've written? Or I'm here to help. Uh, does anybody write here? Any anybody writing creatively, or are you all sucked into your classes and you got to read this chapter and that book? And, and does it all rush by? I mean, a lot of. I was at Berkeley and I read the 10 great books. And the guy who gave the class, Ian Watt was his name, and he's a big eminence there. And we'd have one week to read, uh, let's see, uh, Moby Dick. And it's that thick. Or, so you're lucky. <laughs> no, really, I was up all night, you know, cramming, and, and I couldn't even go to the you know, classic comic book and read that version. Uh, but I used every aid I could get, and that's when I, I was speed reading, and I'm a slow reader, but uh, that's where I kicked it up a few notches. And to read War and Peace in a week, we had one novel a week in that class, and that was, that's what I, what I meant when I said, and when I transferred to UC Berkeley, I was like hitting a wall. And I said, oh, but, and the kids that I was, other people in the classroom, they were all valedictorians from their high schools and salutatorians. They were top students. And there I was, all brasquachi, <laughs> you know, ill prepared, and I'm speed reading War and Peace. Come on, that's not, that's not, it doesn't deepen you. 
my deepest reading experiences have been when you have a nice place to sit and just read and it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. But when you have to speed read classics, it's, that's why it's almost, I keep reading because your best reading will probably be after you leave college. Yeah. Oh, I think there was, there's several. Oh, yeah. Not up there. Um, do you ever feel disconnected from your culture, given that like you've been in westernized um, countries for so long? What, what was the first part of the question? Like, do you ever feel disconnected from your culture? Uh, disconnected. Uh, or like, do you ever feel Well, disconnected? actually, it's just the opposite. When I first went to Peru, it was like going back to the rancho where I spent part of my childhood in El Paso. My grandmother had a farm, a dairy ranch, actually, surrounded by pigs and goats and you know, she'd just go out and get the dinner, grab a chicken and whack, and, and we'd run around, little kids, four, five, six years old, and we're chased, being chased by the headless chicken. Well, I thought that was normal. Or to watch uh, other animals being butchered. And it was, and I, my room was, the house was made of adobe. So it was like living the way a lot of people live around the world, within mud. Uh, so when I went to Peru, it was like, hey, I can, they have tamales and empanadas and the chile is a little different, but, and the music, and I can speak to people and they understand me, and uh, there was a lot of commonality there. And then I discovered, once I started roaming around the world for People Magazine, because I was comfortable abroad. That's why they, and, and then I'd nail a story and they said, well, send them out again. So I kept a bulletproof vest and a helmet in my office because, and my passport because with a bag ready to go. And often I would be given, you know, the space shuttle Challenger just went down, get up to Maine and uh, get us a story or Hurricane Mitch in Honduras, get down there. Uh, or if it was a war zone, I grabbed the best, like in Sarajevo or uh, uh, Kuwait, uh, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia. And when I went to very primitive places, there was, a, I felt like uh, very comfortable. You know, that people are all black in Somalia around me, but there was a, they live in adobe i can relate to that and they milk their goats i can relate to that um, sometimes it was a language problem but you can get translators for that and so um the, it was good that i went into the peace corps and i also had a, an early uh, taste of what it was like to live poor because i could relate and that really helped in a lot of uh, situations. Uh, one, for example, I could empathize with a father, an Aboriginal father in Australia. His two sons, they were soccer stars, and they were found hanging in their jail cells. Well, they did, they do in Australia, they still do what we often did with uh, uh, black, uh, people who were suspected of this or that, hang them. And I went to interview this man. And this was right after my uh, second son died. Uh, he was killed uh, walking on a sidewalk in San Bernardino with my wife in front of the Goodwill store. They were, that's where they were going. And some 16-year-old girl turned the corner too fast and jumped the curb and hit him, missed my wife. And he died. So one thing I've learned, it's not just, you have to bring your whole self when you're doing journalism. If you want to get to the, quickly, you want to get to the root of things. And I told this man who wouldn't unburden himself, and you know, journalists love to write down emotion. And this guy finally did but I think he said, well, you're not going to understand what it feels like. And I told him, look, I, you know, I lost a son too. Well, as soon as he, I said that, I was like a brother. 
and he he emoted you know it sounds horrible but you unlock the heart that way when you say look I've been there I know what it's like I think of my dead son every day and that happened 35 38 years ago uh, anyway and and then I ended up what they called on the death beat or the D beat death disaster and destruction that was my nickname at People Magazine. Oh, send Ron. And it was to cover horrible things in this magazine that's full of celebrities and losing weight and beautiful people. And then you got this story about people starving in Ethiopia. Oh, I don't want to read that. But I did those stories, and, and I think it's because I had suffered some loss. It helped me empathize with the kid who just lost his two parents in, in a war zone in Ethiopia, and he's an orphan. So I, I could get close to that. I'm sure we all have a bit of sadness experience that we can use, whether we're doctors or lawyers, whatever we're in, we end up doing it, or just to empathize with a neighbor who, you know, what do I do? I don't want to. He just lost his wife. I can't go over there. That's sticky. And well, you're not doing it for yourself. Don't worry about yourself. They want to know. And I, I still remember everybody who was at my son's funeral. It helped. Um, so this, whatever uh, role in life or wherever your career is going, I'm sure you can use your own experience. It really helped as a journalist, though, for me. And my background. To answer your question, yeah, I felt very comfortable in wherever I've been, even in the Arctic. Freezing my you-know-what off. <laughs> <clears throat> Did stories up there. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. How did the idea of including David in the story come about? Well, because... There was, we found a dead body once. We were out there playing in the river and there's a guy. So I, that, that was true. In fact, even the snow, that snow scene, that happened. It, you, it snowed a little bit in Burbank, I think, the other day, a few weeks ago. Well, it, it smo snowed in Glendale and right over where I lived, Elysian Valley back in 48, I think it was. And that cloud moved right over and dropped the snow. I didn't make that up. It, was, it came from, I just moved around some of the facts. But, and the dead body, I didn't have a name, but my mother needed some help. We had a lot of um, trees in our backyard, and we were living, living then in El Sereno. Anybody from El Sereno? OK. You are um, Lincoln Heights. Right? Well, anyway, we needed help, and my mother went down to Tijuana and uh, found a guy named David, put him in the trunk, and she brought him over. He was he was the original Mojave. He didn't cross a river to get a wet back, but um, my mother did something illegal. But you know, she was about breaking the rules and bending, and this guy David. I combined them, took one guy's name and the other guy's body, actually. And then Mrs. Renteria, there was a neighbor who we always felt sorry. Era viuda, and, or Beata, that's what we called her, La Beata. You know, somebody, uh, an old spinstress. Well, I cobbled together that, and I was always inspired by a, a William Faulkner story. What's the story? Does anybody remember that? There's a William Faulkner story. Rose for Emily. A rose for Emily. A rose for Emily. And I thought, well, hell, if Faulkner can do it, I can do it too. <coughs> so that's how my mind worked. And I, I was into the characters and the plays, and out it came. So I didn't, didn't take much to make that up or put it together. Otra pregunta. Don't be shy. Da, da, da. Huh? Um, 
Well, can you tell us about um, your experience um, with um, Jorge Luis Borges? Well, <clears throat> you like Borges stories, right? Yeah, I did too. I like some. Uh, but he was, um, he was blind, pretty much blind. And I got into this, uh, part of my scholarship after Berkeley, when I left, I dropped out my end of my junior year. Dropped out and I got a little stipend from the scholarship, uh, Inter-American Press Association scholarship. But one of the stipulations was to enroll in a university class. So me being the kind of, you know, I take the easy way out, and you know, I'll just sign up for something in English. I can handle that. It would turn out to be Middle English, which is like a foreign language, if you've ever heard it. And this is beyond Chaucer, earlier. And who's the teacher? This guy named Borja. I didn't know who he was. Well, I found out eventually that he was some eminencia. And, and uh, so he came in being led by an, this, his assistant, I think her name was Rosa, uh, and Anna Kane. Then he'd get up there in a podium like this, and the class was about this big. It was at the University of Buenos Aires in the Facultad de Filosofía y Letras. And there I am, all ready to do my email. Oh, this, I'll knock this off, because I, I was working for Associated Press. I got a little stringing job. Uh, <clears throat> then later for the Buenos Aires Herald. But the class, I thought, oh, I'll, because I want the money, the scholarship money. And, and then he starts sort of mumbling, and then he looks up, and he can't really see us, so, but everybody's atento, you know, listening. And then he starts, uh, w w he didn't have any books, no notes, just started reciting uh, Middle English in the accent of that time, you know, Beowulf. And, and we were required to do a lot of research, and he was an encyclopedia. I mean, his mind. Uh, you ask questions, you get a very curt answer. He's always very sweet natured. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to really. Um, feel that I knew him much more than that because immediately I uh, fell for this girl behind me. And so we, I had my girlfriend to, that she uh, was, um, held my attention more than Borges. So I wasn't paying much attention. Not a very good student. And I muddled through part of the class, and then I dropped out, hoping the scholarship people wouldn't find out. And it turned out they didn't care. They just wanted a body down there. And I really got into the reporting, though. I love running all around Argentina and Buenos Aires, reporting stories of everything from, it was a British newspaper, so I had to report on things like polo and cricket and Anglican church services. Um, stuff I didn't know anything about, but I learned. I had a good mentor, and the guy who sat next to me, I think I wrote about that, that story, Toby. And, uh, and I learned to work with Brits. I, you know, the difference between Scottish people and Welsh and Irish and various English. So that was an eye-opener. And here, surrounded by a sea of Italians and Spanish-looking people and their Spanish was sounded like Italian. Uh, it was pretty strong stuff for a 20-year-old Chicano who uh, dropped out of Berkeley and went down there on his own. And very lonely, though. It's like being in New York City and you don't, or in LA, you don't know anybody and nobody's friendly. They're all on their own agenda. So. So if you ever go abroad and you feel lonely, there's, there's some good. Either look for romance or... <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? God, I hope my wife doesn't hear that. <laughs> yes? Uh, 
how many your years of journalism, what was the most interesting story that you had to cover? Uh, I think the most unusual and fascinating, because it's almost uh, lyrical, uh, well it is. It's about a woman uh, from uh, an Amazon tribe uh, called a Stone Age tribe. They live a naked existence from the southern Venezuelan, Brazilian area, uh, the Yanomamo. And uh, she was married off by the chief of her, their nomadic people uh, to an American anthropologist who brings her to the United States. Her name was Yadima brings her to Philadelphia, and she's pregnant, and wants to have her baby in the river. Of course, it's, it's frozen at the time. The uh, Delaware River is frozen, and she can't, they found her trying to deliver her on the ice, so they took her to a hospital. And, and she was a woman who had never worn clothes, and never knew anything about our world, so it was like when I got there, she had just arrived and um, had her baby, and it was like list, uh, meeting somebody from centuries ago, the way, you know, before Europeans had arrived. And, and it was uh, very cold out, I remember, in the apartment, and uh, she gave the baby to her husband, was Ken Good, uh, and she asked if I, I was leaving, she, can I go out with you? So we went outside and it started to snow. And she'd never seen snow. And, uh, and this is a woman who didn't eat our food. She had to eat only grub worms and tarantulas. That's all she, that we, I mean, we might think that's icky, but uh, that's her world. And, and there were other things, like never seen a, her face in a mirror never turned a f switch light on, the light goes on in the room, or toilets were to devour you. Cars were like animals with big lights and they were gonna eat her. She had all kinds of language that, that uh, I got translated to give me her view of the world. And it would be as if uh, Columbus, the first European, interviewed somebody or got to know them. Well, this is an even greater leap because uh, this, our world is so different from a life in a jungle uh, forest. So we go out and it starts to snow and Yadima is very pretty uh, with sticks in her mouth. I mean, way beyond piercing. I mean, these, these are real decorative and, uh, tattoos, of course, and of their own kind. And... Um, <clears throat> That we, we hold out our hands and I show her and I, you can taste it and, and her the light it just glowed and we started giggling together it's as if she would never uh, touched snow before it was almost like that scene in the Garcia Marquez about the, the ice right uh, so and there were other very poetic parts of that story and that and that and the magazine used that picture of Yadima with the sticks over and over, and I had to keep doing updates. And it still hasn't finished. Uh, her grown son, the one I saw as a baby, is now a biochemist in Florida, and the mother left him when she was six. She couldn't take our world anymore and fled back to her jungle. Uh, tribe and the son wanted to find his mother and the National Geographic was doing a special on them and flew him down and he met her and now and he stayed for months he fell in love with his mother again he wanted to find out why did you leave us and she, because at the time the la her last words were she handed over three kids that she bore from this Philadelphia anthropologist and said, you keep your white babies, I'm out of here. And she <laughs> took her clothes off and ran in, and he hadn't seen her. I still hasn't seen her, but the son did. David, his name turns out to be. And, uh, and he said he's going to try to do a lot to help their tribe and 
because they're encroached on by miners, hunters, forestry people. Uh, they're kind of decimating that part of the Amazon. So he's all about saving the tribe and the environment there. So that was probably the most unusual story, but I've had a lot of others that have come close. Um, another, and celebrities, oodles. But, uh, the sweetest celebrity was, uh, I think, was uh, Shirley Temple. Before she died, this was about 10 years ago, I interviewed her up near San Francisco, and uh, she had a book about her life as a diplomat, and not just a child star, a lot of that, of course, because that's what she's known for. And then for years later, we kept up a phone friendship. And my, my wife was almost getting tired. I was, Ron, it's Shirley again. <laughs> and we just, because I went up, interviewed her, and the first thing she did was invite me into the kitchen and make me a sandwich. And, and then she'd go out and have a smoke on the patio and come back in. And she died last year. But I wrote a little remembrance for a People magazine, or you can Google it and uh, put my name in Shirley Temple and you'll see uh, the piece. Um, and that was one of the sweetest, uh, not very dramatic, but she, she turned out, most of those, most famous people are a person underneath, you know, just have to get away from the spotlight. And the political leaders. Well, Daniel Ortega, uh -huh. and uh, and and then uh, I spent a lot of time waiting for a, a, a Panamanian dictator, Noriega, but he never showed. Um, Indira Gandhi from India, uh, and I interviewed her briefly. Uh, the man who defeated the U.S. in a sense, he was the head of North Vietnam's army, General Jop, G-I-A-P. Uh, I was sent to Hanoi for three months to uh, write with a group of other journalists to write a lot of stories for an entire issue of People magazine about Vietnam 25 years after the end of the war. So I ended up interviewing uh, General Jop, and it was a very surreal experience because that morning I was jogging in this five-star hotel in Hanoi. I'm jogging on the third floor, and right beneath me is the Hanoi Hilton where people like Senator John McCain were tortured and kept for years, and, and others. And there I am in air-conditioned comfort, jogging, and I'm watching Apocalypse Now, the movie. And then in the afternoon, I go to interview General Chop, and I said, okay, you're retired now, you're a history teacher, what's your favorite activity? And he said, um, I love movies. And I said, what's, what kind of movies? War movies. Oh, what's your favorite movie? Apocalypse Now. He was an addict. He knew all the lines. And why? Because most of the Americans come off like wackos, you know? And, um, anyway, that, that, was, uh, that was another <laughs> leader, I, you know, uh, Charlton Heston, I think of his Moses, but I interviewed him when, before he just was on the way out, he had prostate cancer, and, um, and, and other, uh, even the leader from the 60s that you uh, leaders from the 60s? Yeah, that came back and you went to, I think it was a black leader. Oh, yeah, Stokely Carmichael. Carmichael, yes, the black Yeah, Kwame Touré. Uh -huh. And he was living in Guinea, uh -huh. but he had come back pretty much to get treatment for, again, prostate cancer, which I had, have, too. But uh, it gets a lot of guys. And uh, I'm okay now. Uh, but I interviewed him. And that was unusual because uh, this guy was sort of one of the leaders of the Black Power Movement, uh, the uh, Black Panthers, sorry, mm -hmm. up in Oakland. And he was the Minister of Communication. And then he left right in the 60s. He went to Africa and he says, I don't want your world anymore. I'm going back to my roots and my people. 
So he went to Guinea and he was there, but I got the first interview with him in Harlem. He was at his mother's house. And he was uh, sitting in a big uh, wicker chair. He looked like a throne and he had these two guys with dashikis on, you know, the African shirts. And, and they looked like uh, the big guys. And they were his bodyguards or assistants. So I go up there and, and he's giving me the evil eye pretty much. Like, well, what are you? Who are you? Unfortunately, I had a, a, a photographer who could imitate anything. He's very good. Peter Serling, white guy. And he said, hey. And he goes up and gives him this black handshake and he spouts something or other. But it's what we called in those days jive talk. And Stokely Carmichael, or also known as uh, Kwame Touré, looks at him and the guy's kind of tense. And I'm thinking, Peter's the history, and I am too. <laughs> and, and this Peter said, yeah, I used to be a deliver the Black Panther newspaper and, and in New Haven, Connecticut. And, Stokely Carmichael says, no way, because we didn't allow any white guys to do it. And he said, well, you made an exception for me, because I grew up in a black neighborhood in New Haven, and they recruited me. And Stokely believed him, embraced him, and then embraced me, and I got the story. But I'll tell you, it's, and I did a number of stories with this Peter Serling, in fact, I loved all the photographers that I worked with. They were neat. They weren't head cases like most writers and reporters. Photographers just like to shoot. They, they like the moment and capture that. And so it's a great picture that I got of him, uh, Stokely, and me, and these big guys. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was the 60s later. So. Any other? You guys are probably going to... Um, yeah. Where are you? I'm wrong, but earlier you said that you ran five miles with um, Daniel Ortega. Yeah, I did. Can you well, talk a little bit about that? Well, in those days, it was not easy, but I was in shape. In fact, waiting for that interview, every day I would run around Managua. Now, Managua is, was devastated by an earthquake in the early 70s, I believe. And, and it's still a lot of remnants of the buildings collapsed and you see empty lots. And so I ran everywhere just with my Walkman. In those days, we had these little tapes. And, and I'd run down to the lake and back. Um, so I was in shape. And when they picked me up, the Jeep with the guys with the Kalishnikovs, I write about that in that, that story. Do you have that story? That that story about I mean it's actually very short, but the what happened is I'm running and trying to keep up with uh, Daniel Ortega who's in pretty good shape and they had taken over expropriated a, a golf course a country club and and now it was pretty much a personal running path for for Daniel and I'm running and. The Ortega says, don't go in the rough because there's snakes in there and poisonous. And, and so, but I've got in front of me is a, a Jeep with a Scottish, very cantankerous, foul mouth Scottish photographer. He's the one guy I didn't care for that much, but he's a good photographer. And he was taking pictures of Danielle running and he kept yelling for me to get out of the picture, because I, I had to run and hold the tape recorder. I literally did the interview on the run, asking Daniel questions. And we were jogging, not a real hard run, but, and so I'd get out of the picture and into the rough, and Danielle would be saying, get out of there, they're poisonous snakes. And so I was back and forth, and finally I said, screw it, uh, or harsher terms, and, uh, <laughs> I left and I just said, I don't care about this photographer. I want to get my interview. He's got enough pictures. And, and that guy he finally gave up yelling at me, 
But I'll read you the ending of that story because I think it's kind of an ironic ending. And that's another thing. A lot of Chicano writers don't use irony. And, and, and I don't know, I grew up reading a lot of Jewish American writers who were loaded with irony. And uh, the name of the story is Snakes. It's appropriate. And uh, <laughs> this time. so I'll just read the last paragraph for himself. Okay. Uh, before the end of the run, I'd had it with Harry. That was the photographer's name. I told him where he could stick his camera, and I stayed close to Ortega, squeezing in as many questions as I could. When we stopped running, we were both soaked. So were the men with the Kalishnikovs. But once we all caught our breath, we were all smiles, relaxed. The soldiers not so stiff and military. Harry came up with another photo possibility. Ortega with a Mets baseball cap and t-shirt, which we brought with us from New York. Ortega, a major league baseball fan, eagerly tugged off his wet shirt and slipped on the new one. Then he put on the cap. Harry asked if he could take photos of him seated cross-legged in the rough, head and shoulders above the weeds. Very well, Ortega said, and moved to where Harry indicated. I looked at the soldiers. They were amused, and a few were chuckling and making attaboy comments. No one seemed to be worried about the snakes. And that's how that run ended. But I never got to tell that story until now. And, you know, because People Magazine just wanted this pretty little profile of Ortega. And they really chucked that up. And it was the only time one of my editors came in. Because I got a great interview. I spent hours, I think, this was a couple days later. I got the call to interview Ortega for a couple hours, one on one, just in a little room. And I taped it, and, and I wrote this great little piece that nobody had about his time in prison under the Somoza regime. And uh, the editor came in, and in those days, the copy of the story was in print. It wasn't just on, on a screen. And he tossed it on my desk and he said, what are you, a pinko? And I was so naive. He was saying, what are you, a communist? Because I portrayed a human being, not some cartoon figure. And uh, he really bared his soul to me, I thought. And, but the editors didn't like it. Now, People Magazine is run by Time Inc. Or Time Magazine. And most, it's pretty Republican, pretty right wing or conservative. They don't want to offend. And in those days, you couldn't write a sympathetic pro portrait of a, a, a communist leader, which is what Ortega was and still is in many ways. So politics every now and then got in. And I almost quit over that, but I figured, you know, I need the paycheck. And there are too many other good stories I could do. It's still, and not to quit for that. Any other questions? <clears throat> you guys? Yeah, we they stayed. Oh, well, wow. Yeah. If you guys are ready to leave, I'll stay <laughs> after and chat or sign or whatever. Oh, by the way, Damas and Charlie is now online. It's an e-book. If you haven't read it, you want to put it on your iPad. Eight bucks or something. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. And if you want your book, sign. <laughs>